as we look at the season around us, we just come out of Christmas. And there are thoughts that come through my mind. Some of them might scare you if I told you, just because even I'm afraid to enter into my own mind, and I'm afraid I'll get stuck there. But tonight I like to look at this thought. Christmas in the Celestials. Christmas in the Celestials. When we look at that word celestial, C-E-L-S-T, C-E-L-E-S-T-I-L, we find it in one verse in the entire Bible. It is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 40. In that passage of scripture, the verse in the King James Bible reads, There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial one and the glory of the terrestrial, terrestrial is another. Tonight I want to focus on that word celestial. That is the only verse it occurs in the King James Bible in the English word celestial. The Greek word for the celestial is aparamius, and it actually occurs in 18 different verses of the New Testament. And every time that it occurs, it's referring to something heavenly. It's not just the stars, but it's something heavenly. If we would get down to the deeper meaning of that word, apparatus, if I'm pronouncing it right, means above the sky. So it's not just in our sky, but it's above the sky. Like I said, in every verse that it's used, it's referring to something heavenly. It's not the sky that we think of as in blue skies and clouds, but it goes beyond that in the stars and it's even beyond. We know that there are at least three different heavens. The first one being the sky, the second one being outer space, and the third one being where God dwells. We get that from 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 2, where Paul wrote, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot know. God knoweth. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. So when we look at that word celestial, it's referring to anything above the sky. And as I've already mentioned, it's, every time it's used, it's referring to something heavenly. It's interesting when we get to the heavenly, because way back in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, we have the first recorded conversation between the Godhead. For God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So we know that there were conversations that took place in heaven. We also know the beg for Isaiah, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Even though they're not always recorded, there are conversations that have gone on between the Godhead throughout the centuries. They have emotions. They have thoughts. They have conversations. But if we were to go back way back to maybe around 6 BC, the night that Christ was born, I can only imagine the conversations that were taking place in heaven that day or that night a Christmas in the Celestials. I can only imagine what that Christmas day was in the eyes of the Father. I wonder what he was thinking that day. There, as he was in heaven on the throne, I can only imagine what was going through his mind. As a father, he just sent his son down to earth in human flesh. Time and time again, we have evidence that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And none of us are debating that. But just to Clear the air, Matthew chapter 8 and 29, we have this 
evidence once again. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee? Hear the demons crying out and testify, Jesus, thou Son of God, art thou come hither to torment us before our time? All of creation knows that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But what was Christmas in the celestials like that first Christmas morning for the Father, knowing that he sent his Son down to earth? And not just any sons, because he only has one. In John chapter 1 and verse 14 states, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John chapter 1 and verse 18, No man has seen the Father at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, hath he declared. John 3.16, that famous passage once again testifies that Jesus Christ was the only Son of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I can only imagine what that first Christmas was like through the <coughs> eyes of the Father. Here he sent his Son to earth, wrapped, wrapped in humanity. But not just any Son, his only Son. There was none before him, and there was none after him. This was the only Son of God. And he sent him down here with one purpose in mind. And it wasn't to be born, but it was to die. The eyes of the Father that Christmas morning, if we could run through his mind, what was he thinking? What was he feeling? Realizing that on this day, his only son was born in human flesh, not to be born to fulfill a miracle or prophecy, but to die. That was the only reason that he was sent to be born. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 8 states, And all they that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names were not written in the book of life, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. We all know the wrestle that went on in the mind of Jesus Christ that night in the Garden of Gethsemane to a degree. We know that he struggled with it. He went back, back and forth three times praying, Father, not my will, but thine be done. Over him giving his own life. But what was running through the mind of that Father that night, realizing, although he knew throughout all these centuries, that his son would have to come to die for the sins of humanity. He knew that from the foundations of the world. And he knew how he was going to die. Because the Holy Ghost was inspired in Psalm chapter 22. 500 years before the crucifixion was even event, began describing in detail how the Messiah would die. There, that crucifixion day. The Messiah, the Father there in heaven, looked down and beheld his only Son, wrapped in human flesh, born for no other reason but to die for the sins of the world. Who could fathom and who could really know or understand what would be running through the his mind that day? One of the hardest things it is said to occur for a parent is to have to bury a child. Because it's not natural. The natural thing is for the grandparents to pass away, then the parents, then the children, because it's the natural order of progression because of age. But for a parent to have to bury their child before their time, how difficult is that? 
How much more difficult would it be for a parent to send their son into this world knowing that he didn't come to fulfill a bunch of miracles, but the sole purpose was to die for the sins of humanity. He was sending his son to bring, restore that relationship that was lost in the garden. What was going through the father's mind that morning, that first Christmas morning in the celestial house? I wonder what was going on <coughs> through the eyes of the Holy Ghost there that first Christmas in the Celestials. When we look at the Holy Ghost, He's the doer of the Godhead. If we would go back to Genesis, they would speak it, and the Holy Ghost would act. We see that throughout the works of Jesus Christ. The miracles He did was through that of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the one who bears witness of Jesus Christ. And he was the one that started the work. Nine months, probably about nine months prior to that first Christmas day there in the Celestials. He was the one that was recorded and written about in Luke yeah. chapter 1 and verse 35. And the angel said unto her, speaking to Mary, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also the holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And now, on that first Christmas morning, the Holy Ghost was finally seen what was the fruit of His work. The Messiah was finally born and brought into this world. The one of whom he would speak of was born that first Christmas morning. I wonder what the Holy Ghost was thinking on that first Christmas in the Celestials. But there were others in the Celestials that morning, that evening, that afternoon, whatever time it was, and those were the angels. I wonder what they were thinking that first Christmas morning. What was going through their minds? What were their emotions? For the Father, we speculated. For the Holy Ghost, we speculated what he was feeling. Maybe what he was thinking a little bit. But the angels, we know what they were feeling that first Christmas morning. Day. It is recorded in Luke chapter 2. They were filled with excitement. You see, the angels, they don't comprehend, they don't understand what salvation is. They've never had that opportunity because they've seen God in His fullness. They've seen God in His glory. That mountain that is recorded that Lucifer wanted to ascend They've seen God sitting upon that throne that Ezekiel recorded with the rainbow wrapped around the angels have beheld. They've seen God in his fullness. They've watched on as Michael and the other angels kicked the fallen one third from heaven to the earth. They beheld all those things. But they never had the hope of salvation. And because of that, to them, salvation is a mystery. They don't comprehend it. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10-12. through 12. <coughs> The Bible states, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it did testify beforehand the suffering of Christ and the glory that should follow unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel and unto the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven which things the angels desire to look into. They don't comprehend it. They don't understand it. And that first Christmas morning, I can only imagine as they looked down 
with excitement and anticipation. Perhaps there was a celebration going on amongst the angels that day, knowing that the Messiah has finally come down in the flesh, but not fully comprehending what it fully meant. But they could not contain their excitement. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 8, 14 states, And there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. Notice singular, the angel of the Lord, one. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings and great joy which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in the manger. As we look at this passage, we see one angel on the scene delivering the message that the Messiah has been born. Whether God instructed only one angel to come, Scripture does not state. But what we have here, we know one angel delivered the message. And then finally, in verse 13, whether God sent the rest of the angels down, or they just could not contain their excitement, all of a sudden, in verse 13, we find, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host. Not just another one, not just two or three, but a host, thousands. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Whether God sent only one angel, or rather he sent a host, Scripture doesn't say. All we do know is there is one angel declaring unto the shepherds the good news. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere, a grand host of angels filled the atmosphere there above the shepherds. And tell them, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace be will for men. The angels that first Christmas morning looked on with excitement not fully understanding what was taking place, but knowing something grand and spectacular was happening for those who were left on the earth, for those who were promised the hope of salvation. The Messiah had come, and the angels looked on, and they were excited that first Christmas morning. But how do we feel about Christmas? But more importantly, how do we feel about that first half of Christmas? How do we feel about Christ? How do we treat him, or how do we feel about him on a daily basis? Are we excited every morning? Or do we just push him off to the side? Is it something that's personal to us? Or is it just something that we do? like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. We go through our religious routine. When we read the Bible, are we excited about it? Are we actually searching it and reading it with a sincere heart? Are we open to the Holy Ghost moving as we read and speaking to our heart? Or are we just doing it quickly to get it over? What is our prayer life like? Is it something that we do? Or is it frustrating on the table to the point of maybe... Bless us, we bless you in our bodies. Amen. Do they mean something to us? Are we excited about it? How do we treat Jesus Christ on a daily basis? The angels were excited about that first Christmas morning. They maybe they didn't fully understand what was going on, but they were excited about it. How do we treat Jesus every day? Do we allow him to work through us? Or do we allow him only to work when we need him to? Do we pray when it's not easy? Or do we pray only with a specific purpose in mind when we feel the need really to? <coughs> We're coming into a new season. Let us let God, let Christ work through us every day. Let us desire to be so close to him that he doesn't have to speak to us through science 
or wonders, or even whispers, or faint glimpses. But may we hear him clearly, as a friend would speak to a friend in clear words. May we allow the Holy Ghost to use us, not as we see fit, but as he sees fit. There is coming a day where the Bible refers to her as the Queen of the South. The Queen of Sheba will rise up on Judgment Day. If we look at the life of the Queen of Sheba, she left her homeland to search out for Solomon, to see how wise he was, to see if the rumors were true. She left those things behind to search for something greater. And on that day of judgment, She's going to pose a question. A greater than Solomon had come. But what did you do with him? What did you allow him to do through you? No. This year has practically gone already. And we're about to enter 2016. What will we do with Jesus? Will we be excited? Will we desire to look into the things of God with anticipation and excitement, even if we don't understand it like the angels? Or will we hold back and keep everything to ourselves, wondering what could have been if only we would not have held ourselves back and allowed God to work for us? If we sought him like never before. This Christmas season, may we find God and desire to see him like never before. May we desire to speak to him like never before. May our prayer life be not like a cartoon that I came across recently. It simulated a husband and a wife talking and he was asking her to do something. And it was, Emily dear, would you please get this when you go to the store? Emily dear, would you get this? Emily dear, would you do that? Emily dear, would you get the milk? Emily dear, pour in the glass. Emily dear, so many times. And it was simulating how so many times we pray to God. Dear God, do this. Dear God, do that. Before we're done. Because we don't know how to pray. No. May this be the year if we don't know how that we learn how to pray like that before. And if we already know how to pray, may we allow the Holy Ghost to take us deeper in prayer. And teach us how to pray more deeply than ever before. For that is your desire today. To draw closer to God than ever before. To be more excited about spiritual things than ever before. To take part like never before. Let us find ourselves around the altar. And find ourselves shut in in that secret pray place. Praying God. May I just find you and know you like never before. May I allow you to use me. May I be a willing vessel this upcoming year that the Holy Ghost may speak to others through, that they may see you. As Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, that the Father may be magnified and glorified. When we stand on Judgment Day, may we find that glorification of the Father saying, well done, that faithful servant. I was able to work through you in a way that wasn't anybody else because they weren't willing. May we be willing. May we gather, find our place of, place of prayer around the altar.